Hello folks, welcome to Rational Science, the only site on the internet that does physics rationally. Everybody else does math and irrational explanations. Anyways, we have a great day today. We're going to be doing uh, dark energy, whatever that is. But uh, let's begin with our extinction segment. Some people had some questions we're going to be addressing here and here let's go with the first one the fellow says calhoun's experiments amount to a description not a physical mechanism yeah absolutely he's, he's right there we don't actually know why or which factors and pathways lead to that result and that is also true um what we need to do is look at the different um you know, parameters uh, that can affect this experiment and study each one, you know, uh, test them out and then reach our conclusions, you know, our theories. And he continues as a certain phenomena in rats over condensed um, timescales doesn't exclude injections or envir environmental toxicity. Well, I don't know about injections. <laughs> But yeah, a lot of these animals have received injections, you know, for different things. And I guess we lost track of uh, what animal got what, possibly, you know. So that's one thing that we have to look into. Uh, it says uh, 92 to 94 is the key period. They introduced the uh, hepatitis B vaccine at birth and started piling on other shots. Uh, well, they had shots all the way to at least the 1950s. You know, I received my shots in school in the 60s, so I don't think they started in the 90s. Way too short for mutational load. Um, and again, the question there is whether mutations can occur from one generation to the next. The answer is yes, they can. You know, you can mutate even uh, get close to a nuclear weapon. <laughs> or a source of radiation, you'll probably mutate a lot of your uh, atoms. So, uh, you know, as far as shortness is concerned, you know, we can all mutate quite uh, quickly. Uh, our cells, our uh, atoms, our, you know, molecules in, in our body change. Uh, he said, this is the kind of thing you would do to people deliberately. And yeah, the issue there is that, you know, um, Calhoun repeated his experiment that you see there on the right. Those were the results. Uh, mice, he did it first with rats, then he did it with mice. He did a total of at least 25 experiments. I don't know if he did any more after that, but he did 25 experiments, called them utopian universes. And uh, number 25, which is, I guess, the classical one, he allowed the mice to multiply. He started with four couples, and they were normal couples. They started building their nests uh, normally, having kids, you know. They were in paradise. And um, after a few months, as you can see there, they multiplied all the way to 2,000 mice. And eventually, the uh, place got so crowded on the one hand, and uh, also the mice became autistic and homosexual. Uh, the female mice became very aggressive. And because of that, you know, the population started dropping until it reached extinction. In fact, I think he, he did not allow, um, John Calhoun did not allow the um, mice uh, the, the experiment to, to finish because he said it was so horrible to watch that he just terminated and I guess he killed all the mice and his conclusion or his uh, his corollary was they stopped being mice and someone asked a um, question there what, how, how uh, we know that they were autistic and again you know they, they held these mice in their hands and they they, they were dumb. They, they were not normal mice like, you know, the, the mouse that runs around and hides and, you know, etc. They were just, you know, like <laughs> dumb. <laughs> they were not very intelligent at all. And you can tell, you know, you don't need to be an expert to, to see that. But uh, to answer this false question, you know, um, if you go back in time, um, we, we've had all kinds of mental and physical problems in the past. And a lot of them were due to inbreeding, which is what this fellow is criticizing. He's saying it's due to vaccines and someone up there in the uh, 
high places. They're doing it deliberately, etc. You know, I doubt that very much. Here, here's a couple examples, just an example, okay? Um, uh, these were a couple of conjoined twins among, not, not the first, but they came before the famous Siamese twins that Barnum and Bailey, you know, showed in their uh, circus, right? Um, and this, this dates to the 1700s. You know, and um, the question is, is this due to vaccines and something like that? Uh, you would think that this is something genetic. These people were born like that, okay? And they were not even the first. Uh, in fact, the first documented ones we have today are these. Here you see them. In the village of Emmaus in Palestine, a child was born perfectly normal below the navel, but divided above it so that it had two chests and two heads each possessing the senses, okay? And essentially they're describing there the uh, Siamese twins that came out and went in the year 385 to 386, okay? And uh, so, you know, we've had uh, problems with genetic births, uh, with genetic problems, right? Uh, from birth, uh, who knows how, how far back in time and let me give you another uh, example, and that is, uh, you know, it said that the Spartans would throw uh, babies who were born wrong, you know, um, from the mountain. They would kill them because they wanted a tough race, you know. <laughs> they wanted everybody to be born normal, and uh, obviously these babies were not homosexual or autistic because you can't tell that when the baby is born. Now, they obviously, if, if they did this, if they really killed the babies uh, when they saw something wrong, it, it was something obvious, and uh, it had to be something physical, something external that you could see right there and then. But the point here is the following. You know, a Spartan uh, and an Athenian considered each other uh, foreigners. You know, Corinthians, Ar Argos, and all these little city-states each one was considered a different country. They all spoke the same language. They prayed to the same gods. They probably had some different accents, right? But the point here is that they considered them each other foreigners. You know, you, you, were, you were not of their um, city state. The country was a city state. And what's the issue? The issue is that, you know, people within the city state would marry people within the city state. They would not marry foreigners. An Athenian would not marry an, a Spartan or a Corinthian or whoever. Uh, so, so we have to keep that in mind. Uh, these were relatively small villages uh, trying to become cities or towns, right? And they inbred they, uh, generation after generation, especially the rich people. You know, they, they had a girl, the other guy had a guy, and so they got them together because they would kind of unite the uh, wealth of the two families. And they did this quite a bit over time. And, you know, what do you think would happen after several generations? Well, you have inbreeding. And we know what happens with, from inbreeding uh, because we see it with the Amish. We see it also uh, some of the kings I talked about in the past, uh, Charles II of Spain, uh, Alexei, the son of Nikolai II, the, the last um, Tsar, you know, they were born with uh, defects. Why? Because they came from families that inbred. Okay? In fact, uh, uh, both uh, Nikki and uh, Alex, uh, they, they were both grandsons, uh, grandson and granddaughter and grandkids uh, uh, from Queen Victoria. And yeah, when you inbreed, well, you get bad children. And that's got nothing to do with vaccines or anything like that. It's got to do with inbreeding. And what does that affect? Well, that has to affect your genes. You know, so I think it's got to do uh, all this uh, stuff that happened to the mice has to do with inbreeding, primarily with inbreeding. But again, he's right. Uh, unless we run a test for each parameter, uh, we won't really and and check them out, which is John Calhoun did not do that. Um, I, I'm not sure if he was aware that he was had a um, uh, you know a, a an original colony uh, with just four mice, uh, four couples of mice that 
who knows where they came from? You know, did he check any of that? He, he, he didn't check uh, the source of these mice. He just said, hey, give me four couples. He put them in there and he says, uh, let's see what happens. Why? Because he, he was a psychologist and he was interested in uh, finding out what crowdedness, you know, uh, density did to uh, the, the animals, these animals, these mice, um, to their brains. That's what he was studying. So he, he didn't check, you know, uh, father, uh, what is it? The, um, uh, well, uh, when you colonize for the first time, you know, he didn't check, um, uh, this, this, uh, uh, oh, what's the term <laughs> escaped my mind. Um, when, when you create a, a colony for the first time, he didn't check any of that because he was studying something else. Okay. And so, yeah, whoever does the experiment would have, again, would have to look at these parameters and find out, you know, uh, which ones have what effects and so on. So I don't think that's ever been done yet, as far as I know. Okay, another fellow uh, raises another issue and he says, have you heard of Douglas Social Credit? Uh huh. The point was to make finance mirror the physical economy so goods keep flowing and periodic financial collapse, among other things, might be remedied. Uh huh. Periodic collapse is a feature of the financial system, not a flaw. But is it a necessity? Uh huh. And I look up uh, this Douglas Social Credit says uh, Douglas attributed economic downturns to discrepancies between the cost of goods and the compensation of the workers who made them. Okay, so this is our starting point, and um, yeah, I kind of uh, agree with him. In fact, that's what my theory in general is. It's that uh, we're going to have a, a economic collapse. And this gives you an idea why, you know, what's happening is we're losing real wages over time. And here's a couple of statistics, okay? Here you see employee wages versus net productivity since 48 all the way to 2017. And what you can see there is that productivity, meaning, you know, how much money really the uh, big corporations and the rich people make compared to... Uh, the wages of the uh, of, of the workers, right? And one is outstripping the other. And you'll see several um, uh, graphs similar to these. Uh, here's another one. Okay, this is for the United Kingdom. Okay, and you can see real wages. United Kingdom has been dropping since 1964. Okay, so, you know, the workers are losing their, uh, the value of their labor. And here's another one, just in case, okay, final one here, uh, if I can get it here. Uh, labor share of income, okay, and you can see how that's been dropping at least in the last so uh, 50 years or so, okay. And yeah, what's happening, or the way I look at it, is that uh, we are uh, the workers, the proletariat, the person who depends on a salary, on wages, is losing the value the real value of their wages over time. And you cannot continue doing that forever. Okay. And I think what's going to happen at some point in time, uh, people will just earn enough money to make it till the end of the month. And that's going to have a couple of impacts. One will be that corporations will not be able to sell anything extra because there will be no disposable income. People will just be able to pay the rent, eat, and that's it. And then, you know, live one more day. That's about it day to day. That's how they'll live. That's one issue. Another one is that they're going to have to lower the minimum wage to the point where, you know, the, the middle class will be approaching those same, uh, in other words, they, they will not increase the salaries too much of the middle uh, class. And the people in the poor levels will slowly catch up to them. And so we're going to end up with this world where you're either rich or you're poor, you know, nothing in between. And, uh, Maybe not that drastic, but I think we're working towards that type of world. You know, and again, it's called, uh, what? Um, the rich get richer and the poor get poor? <laughs> More or less like that. And you can't continue that forever. And the question is, what's going to change that? You know, especially in this world of uh, services that we have today, I'm not sure we can change that at all. So we're headed in that direction, and I don't think there's any way to stop the train from falling off the tracks or 
over the cliff, right? Okay, but uh, here's a, an issue I'd like to talk a little bit about, and, and this fellow raised it uh, here. He says, says, why do you think the interviewed agents are lying about the U.S. recovering alien spaceships and biology? Uh, lately, there's been talk about, you know, a fellow who blew the whistle on the government saying, hey, you know, they, they really collected some extraterrestrial stuff and they're keeping tight lips about it. You know, it's a secret. And uh, he just came out uh, and saying, look, I know that they've got stuff there that came from extraterrestrial sources and they just don't want the public to know about it, maybe because they could. I guess they fear, supposedly, right, that people will uh, go into some kind of panic mode, you know. And um, so he says, uh, you know, why do you think uh, he's lying? Um, I'm not going to say that they're lying. Uh, they, they probably believe that, uh, strongly believe that, you know, in fact, they have uh, recovered something out there. And for some reason, he believes that it's extraterrestrial uh, source and the government maybe uh, is uh, considering that as a possibility as well. People who do uh, investigation, research, etc. cetera. Um, and so it's not a question of lying. It's a question that they probably do actually believe that these are from extraterrestrial sources. And all I can tell you is it never happened and never will okay and so let, let's let's look at this in a little more detail okay I've never done that to uh, to great satisfaction so let, let me go over this a little bit it's known as uh, Fermi's paradox okay what is Fermi's paradox well we can synthesize it uh, by synthesize it by saying why haven't they you know the extraterrestrials contacted us that's what it's all about why haven't they contacted us? I mean, if, if there are civilizations out there, you would think that there are some civilizations that are more advanced than ours. You know, maybe they, they're 1,000, 2,000, maybe 10,000, 100,000, maybe a million years ahead of us. Man, they have to have all this fancy technology with which not only they can come here, but they can uh, study us, they can conquer us, you know, they can do a lot of stuff. And so Fermi was saying, well, if that's true, if there are millions of other civilizations out there, you know, why haven't they contacted us? Is it that we're too far away? Is it that they haven't seen us? Uh, what's the issue? You know, and you, you can have a lot of theories or assumptions about that. And so let's go over this and let me show you that it's impossible. <laughs> this is the issue, okay? And so the first thing we have to look at is that uh, civilization uh, has to flourish and it's got to be more or less like us okay it can't be a tiger it can't be an eagle it can't be a fish it's got to be a monkey you know intelligence of our level right descends from the trees okay so um, you know uh, you you, you got to create something like us in other in order to be able to do something like you know Fermi's proposing here you know a uh, civilization that goes out of the planet and starts conquering you know the stars the galaxies etc and eventually reaches a planet like ours so the first thing it's got to be you know uh, a, a human like person okay and it can't be anything else it can't be an alligator it can't be you know a tiger uh, a lion or a fish or a bird it's got to be something like us. It's got to be a monkey. Okay? That's, the, that's the first issue. And, um, but in order for life to develop, you've got to have a sun-like star. Okay? And also an Earth-like planet. For this, you've got to look at what is known as the, um, um, uh, you know, the uh, habitable uh, parameters uh, that a sun has to have or an Earth has to have in order for there to uh, for life to develop and for intelligence to develop within life okay intelligence of our when i say intelligence then usually i'll refer to intelligence of our level and uh the nearest star is uh alpha centauri 
okay? Uh, I'm sorry, it's Proxima Centauri, it's the Centauri system, and it's a three-star system. It looks more or less like this in the night sky. You have Proxima, which is the little uh, circle there, and that's the one that's closest to us. The other two are a little farther away, but it's a three-star system. And, you know, just imagine if you uh, are living in a planet that has life over there, like, like the Earth, at least, or similar to the Earth. Imagine a planet, and you wake up in the morning, and you see this, three, three suns. <laughs> okay, you wake up, and uh, there's Alpha, Beta, and uh, Proxima, which is the closest one to us. Okay, uh, it, it, you know, uh, the question is, if you have three stars like that, three suns, and, and they don't have to be all three in the morning. Like, you know, you're going to have all throughout the day, you can have suns, one in the east, one in the west, one, one in the south, whatever. Right? You wake up and you have all these suns around you. So you never have uh, nighttime. It's always daytime. Right? Well, those would be different conditions than what we have here on Earth. Okay? So that's one of the issues you got to look at. But uh, here are other uh, habitable uh, zones, uh, parameters that you have to consider for the habitable zone within the galaxy, okay? And here it is. Let me put this up here. Give me a second. And uh, these are certain parameters that you got to look at. If we're too far away from the sun uh, or too close, uh, probably life would not have developed here on Earth, okay? No kind of life. We, it would have been either too hot or too cold. Maybe if we're uh, above or below the ecliptic, you know, like the uh, red uh, planets there, you know, shown. One could be above, one could be below the ecliptic. Maybe that has some effect. But I think the main ones are, you know, the mass density of the planet. Uh, it could be bigger or it could be smaller, right? And that, that would create different gravity, okay? So, uh, and you have the magnetic field, also the tilt, like, you know, if you, um, if the um, Earth rolled around or spun around its equator, would have been different, right? So the direction in which a planet spins would have an effect. Uh, what kind of atmosphere it has, you know, does it have carbon, water, uh, nitrogen, etc., you know, uh, things that we typically associate with life. Um, volcanic activity and so on. So you got to look at all these parameters and y you know it's like um, a Goldilocks issue. It's got to be just right or more or less right. It's got to be within certain limits. Uh, you have uh, control limits and reject limits and within control limits you would have some kind of life and the question is whether intelligence of our level, of human level intelligence of consciousness would develop in the extremes of these control limits. You know, if you go too far in one direction, too far in the other direction, you may not get, you know, intelligence of our level. You would just get maybe animals, maybe plants, uh, but nothing very sophisticated. And so that's something you got to consider. You know, how far away can a planet be from the sun? How, how big, how small, etc. You know, uh, magnetic field, tilt, you got to look at all those things. Okay, um, one of the questions people say, well, what is intelligence? I mean, you know, uh, do, do all animals, do, do plants have intelligence? And I'm saying they all do, okay? Uh, why? Because the cell has intelligence, okay? Life is a synonym of intelligence in that sense, in the sense that when the cell developed, okay, it was already, uh, you can call that intelligence. That could be the definition of intelligence. Why? Because it was compartmentalized, okay? You can see that the cell, whether it's plant or animal, it's got all these compartments. And uh, we're not talking about just, um, you know, molecules. You have more than molecules. You have compartments, and each one has a function. And it's like they're, they're all coordinated. You know, it's like a CPU. Right. And so in that sense, you can say that uh, plants and animals have intelligence, both uh, at that level. Of course, you know, people say, well, you know, people, when, when they talk about intelligence, they usually talk about human intelligence and they say, well, animals don't have intelligence. You know, they do. But we got to define the word intelligence, which is a very difficult word to define. OK, because what do you mean by intelligence? 
and you say, well, you know, we have humans because they have intelligence and animals which don't have intelligence. That's why people think that humans are not animals, you know, because our highest level of intelligence. And that's more or less like saying that the cheetah is not an animal because he's the fastest runner. Or an elephant's not the uh, not an animal because he's so big, or a whale is so big, you know. So you know there there's kings in each category. There's gold medalists in each category, and we get the gold medal for intelligence. Okay, obviously that's that's our power, right? Intelligence. But you know, uh, Mother Nature gave us intelligence, but that wasn't for free. You know, there, there, there was a, uh, an exchange there. Uh, you had to give something up. And what we gave up is what I call the Achilles curse or blessing, depending on your point of view. Okay, and here it is, uh, good old Achilles, if we can get him up here. You uh, uh, either have a long, uneventful life or you have a very short life with glory. You know, and Achilles chose the short life with glory. You know, he got that air in his ankle there, <laughs> Achilles' heel, right? And um, and he died because of that. He died young. Okay? But he died with glory because, you know, he's even remembered to these days. Okay, so uh, what is that about? Well, it's uh, Mother Nature says, okay, we're going to give you intelligence because, you know, uh, she, she gave all these blessings to all the other animals. He said, the cheetah runs so fast, uh, the elephant has might, you know, and uh, the eagle can fly. What superpowers do I give this poor little monkey? <laughs> Humans, you know, what do we give them? And so she felt pity on us and so says, I'm going to give them intelligence. And so we developed, you know, hand-eye coordination, that kind of thing, uh, and developed our brains and became the rulers of the planet, okay? But what does that do? It, it accelerates our extinction, our track, track towards extinction. Uh, we become extinct faster in great measure because uh, we are able to multiply. We are able to do many things, among them discover you know, some of the bugs that kill, the, kill us. And because of that, we take countermeasures. We, we realize what they do and how to neutralize them, or at least try to. Because of that, uh, we reach our um, level of, uh, of immunity a lot faster than other animals. Other animals take a long time because they do it through a natural process. We do it through, with the help of a lot of artificial stuff. We also uh, realize we have to sleep uh, better and, uh, you know, keep the place clean. We're aware of all these things. You know, other animals, you look at chickens, they're, they're birds in general, doves, you know, pigeons. They're the, the dirtiest animals you can imagine. You know, they just shit everywhere. <laughs> and they, they walk in that and, you know, and they live in that environment. Uh, whenever, like in the case of chickens, you know, they're in this coop and they've got all this uh, manure everywhere, and if you don't clean it, you know, disease develop that sometimes they pass on to humans, you know, so I think a lot of the uh, diseases we got, we got from the animals that we corralled, uh, you know, put them in, in pens and uh, corrals and coops, right? So, you know, um, we learned about these things eventually, and so because we learned, we were able not to die so soon, at the age of five or earlier, and because of that, you know, our population multiplied, meaning that, you know, we were able to move a lot faster than other animals. But all that does makes us more efficient, and efficiency takes us to our early end, extinction. So Achilles um, uh, curse, blessing, could be a curse, could be a blessing. Yeah, we, we have a great life because we have this magical power to think uh, about the universe and uh, things that go around us, but that cost us uh, our long life. That was the exchange. Okay. Um, anyways, we're due for imminent extinction. <clears throat> and so the question is, you know, if we're due for imminent extinction, as we argue here, um, what does that tell us? It tells us that we only had a window of maybe a hundred I'll give, I'll be very 
generous and say 200 years in which we work with electricity and magnetism, be able to send signals and so on. And so think about that for a moment, you know, uh, 100, maybe 200 years. What is that in the time of the universe? You know, talk about millions and billions of years. And here we're talking about 100, 200 years in which we have uh, not only the intelligence to be able to uh, capture signals and send signals, but we developed the technology only in the last 100, 200 years. And now think about that for a moment. Let's say there is a planet somewhere in uh, the Centauri system. Let's make it as close as possible, right? And it's just like the Earth. It's the same size, uh, same density, same magnetic uh, field. You know, we're, 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 we're being very generous here with our uh, assumptions, right? And uh, it's the same distance from the sun, uh, their sun could be beta, which is probably the most uh, sun-like uh, star in that system, uh, you know, that, that's over there. And so the question is, if you have this, this uh, Earth over there, this Earth-like planet, it looks almost like the Earth or just like it if you want, no problem. But then you have the issue of time. You know, we only have 200 years, really I'm being generous there as well, to be able to send and receive signals to Alpha Centauri uh, takes, you know, at least uh, four and a half years for the signal to go. Assuming they are in the same level as we are, they say, hey, we received a signal. It comes from over there, a planet we call, uh, a star system we call the sun, okay? So they send a signal back, you know? And that would be nine years just to get a round trip, you know, answer. And that's only if, you know, they meet all these extraordinary assumptions. Among them, you know, that the uh, beings over there are in that, uh, are, have developed just like us and are at the same level of intelligence in the same time frame. Okay, so you see, we, we have a lot of coincidences to meet in order to do this. More than likely, you know, we won't find a planet that is similar to the Earth uh, in, in the Centauri system. And certainly, uh, I think the biggest coincidence would be if they develop at the same time as we did, more or less at the same time, so that they have the technology to receive, but we have the same technology to send and vice versa. You know, for that to happen, <laughs> believe me, that's a big, big coincidence. And so if you look at these uh, parameters, uh, I think, uh, you know, the chances of there being another planet uh, with uh, intelligence to the degree that humans have somewhere, I don't know, 20, 100 light years in, in the vicinity, uh, you know, it's a, it's a, it, it would be a miracle if it happened. And that's one issue. And then the other one is, because we're talking about Fermi's paradox, you know, why haven't they come here? Okay is that, you know, is it possible for life to travel interstellarly? And the answer here is no. It's impossible for any type of life. In fact, to be able to travel, you can't be a whale, you can't be a bird, you can't be a, uh, you know, fish or anything like that, uh, you know, a four-legged animal that puts all four paws on the, on the ground. It's got to be a, a monkey. Okay? It's got to be like us. Okay? In fact, uh, I go one step further and say that if we could go to another planet that has human level intelligence, the beings look like us. They don't look, they, they don't, they're not green. They don't have little antennas, you know, they don't look like the Klingons. They look like us. Maybe they're a little darker, a little lighter, maybe a little shorter, a little taller, but uh, they look more or less like us. Uh, our, we are the prototype for intelligence of our level. That's one issue. And the other one is that we are the highest level of intelligence in the universe. There can be no higher intelligence than what we are, humans, what hu humans are. Uh, if, <laughs> if, uh, if you don't think that's true, well, maybe you should you know, sue your mother. Maybe you're not intelligent enough. Maybe that's your problem. 
but we are the highest level of intelligence available in the entire universe. There can be no higher intelligence than humans. If you take, um, if, if God came down and sat down next to us and told us how this universe works, we would understand what God is telling us. Okay? There is no way that you can think that we cannot understand how this universe works. Okay? We would if God told us. Okay? Believe me. We have the highest level of intelligence available. And I don't know what people expect from Mother Nature. Do you, it is, what is this super intelligence that they are expecting? That's Hollywood stuff. You know, intelligence of our level, we developed at the highest level. We can think about anything we want. Okay? We can imagine anything we want. Okay? So uh, not only does intelligence walk on two legs and descends from the trees, but it, we have the highest level of intelligence possible in the universe. Okay? Now, what's the issue? The issue is that uh, you, we it would have to be something like us, you know, some humans like us, to be able to travel interstellarly. Again, uh, whales, fish, none of them, uh, birds, you know, uh, lions, they don't think about traveling interstellarly. That's for higher level intelligence like us, the kings of intelligence. Okay? So they, not only would they look like us, but we would be able to build something to travel outside the Earth, which we have, okay? But the question is, can we travel interstellarly? And the issue is no. Here's uh, the, my version versus the mathematical ph the physicist uh, version of how the universe is built. Mathematical physicists and everybody and their mother for the last 3,000, 4,000 years has proposed Particles. That's what they have proposed. Everybody proposes particles, discrete particles, and they try to do everything with particles. And we're saying there's a different universe. Our universe is a single thread. That's all there is. Okay, single closed loop thread, and uh, this turns into all these interconnected atoms. Again, uh, you see what the rest of the world believes and proposes. You know, they have always proposed that. There's nothing different than what you see there on the left. And we propose that all atoms are physically interconnected. Okay? So uh, once we start with that, uh, you can see that it leads to a different uh, types of theories. Okay? So uh, where does this take us? Well, here's uh, why interstellar travel is not possible. Okay? And uh, if all atoms are physically interconnected across the universe, what we have is um, a bird's beak, which comes out of the sun, and all those ropes that interconnect every atom in the universe, um, you know, they connect us to Alpha Centauri system, for example, if we wanted to travel to, to the Centauri system, right? And you see the bird's beak right there close to the sun, and in between you have this linear regime, okay? And so if our spacecraft tried to leave, um, the bird's beak, the more it goes out, the more, the slower it will go. And a lot of people say, well, is that true? I mean, you know, uh, it seems like you got it in reverse, Bill, you know, it should be faster because the uh, sun is pulling. Well, uh, you got to understand the theory, okay? If you're in the linear regime and you're moving along on a constant speed, imagine if you're going towards the sun. Well, as soon as you hit, hit the bird's beak, you're going to be accelerated towards the sun more and more uh, the closer you are to the sun. Okay, so hopefully you understand that, that the closer you are to the sun, you go faster. Meaning that the farther away you go from the sun, the slower you go. The linear regime is a region with no gravity. There's no um, exponential gravity like you feel here on Earth. Okay, and so nothing is pulling on you. That's the issue, okay, from, from the front, from the Centauri system, okay, so, uh, yeah, once, uh, once you start with the uh, hypothesis, the assumption that all atoms are physically interconnected, when you try to leave the um, solar system, you go through this bird's beak, and at some point, you know, in the distance, right, you go slower and slower and slower because unless you have booster rockets, whatever that pushes you, you know, if you if you just travel at whatever speed you were going, suddenly, you know, you go slower and slower and slower. And at that point, you have no gravity that pulls you outwards. 
And so you're going to be traveling through this uh, region forever and ever and ever. And, um, you know, you won't make it to the nearest star because you don't have that many lives. <laughs> okay. So uh, it's never going to happen uh, that a living entity, which has to be like us with the intelligence of humans, with the uh, hand eye coordination to build things, you know, intelligently that can travel outside, that that human will make it to the next star. Okay, it's just impossible. And so that's why we haven't had any visitors here from outside the Earth. And a bigger problem is that, you know, we're about to become extinct. And that's what's going to happen to all humans, no matter where they are born, anywhere in the universe. Any planet where humans developed, in other words, our level of intelligence that can build ships and so on, you know, uh, whenever they reach this point where they can develop things, it's because they've already gotten to a point where they're about to become extinct. And so there's the window is very small. There's only a 200 year window to, on the, on the um, gener generous side, right? Uh, 200 year window in which they can develop this technology and then immediately they die. And so nobody hears about them and nobody's going to hear about us ever. Okay. So yeah, it's a question of space and time. We have, we're it, uh, it's just too distant to the uh, nearest star. That's one issue. And the other one is that time-wise, uh, whoever develops over there immediately goes extinct, immediately meaning within 200 years. And then another civilization develops over there and then another one over there and, and they're all staggered. You know, they're not, they don't occur at the same time. For them to occur at the same time in planets like the Earth, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, where all the um, habitable conditions are met, you know, the statistics have to be ridiculous. You know, it just never happened. Uh, maybe a few within the within a galaxy, billions of suns, you know, you, uh, stars. You know, uh, very few planets probably coincide at the same time and they're probably not next to each other one's on the other side of the galaxy and, and so on so no we have no way of ever traveling or meeting another civilization that can send a message to us and we can send it back never gonna happen never will okay let's move on to the subject matter today and what is that well we're going to talk about um dark energy but before we can get into this dark energy business, uh, we have to look at what we've been looking at lately, and that is mathematical physics. You know, what is this mathematical physics? Is it physics? That's, I guess, the first question. And I've been pounding them lately, okay? Um, uh, what was it? Last week I talked a little bit about them and I treated them as clowns. And yeah, they are clowns, and I don't take it back because I'm really not insulting them. They are clowns because, you know, these uh, celebrities, because they're not scientists at all. They're not physicists at all. What they do is entertainment. They're in the entertainment business. They make money not teaching science because they don't teach science. They teach, they, they're there for entertainment value. And most people out there don't understand that. They think, oh, I'm going to get my shot of science this week. I'm going to listen to, I don't know, uh, Tyson or uh, uh, Brian Greene. And all they're listening to is nonsense. Now, these people don't tell them, you know, when, when they have their shows or their interviews, they don't talk about equations. They don't say, let me show the equation for this and for that. Let me show you the measurements we made. No, they can't talk like that because immediately it would, everybody would turn the TV off, change the channel, you know, go do something better uh, for that day. You know, they're not going to listen to equations. None of these people, and you take my word for it, none of these people talk about equations. They all talk about the physical interpretation of the equation. They try to, you know, uh, reduce it for the layman. So they're, they're, they're there not to talk about equations, about numbers or measurements. They're there to tell you the conclusions. You know, what does it mean? What is the bottom line? That's what they're there for. Okay. Keep that in mind. That's important. Why? Because when you say, look, but that's irrational, what you just said. 
you know, the explanation you just gave me, the physical interpretation. And they say, yeah, you're right. We don't understand it either. And you say, well, if you don't understand it, you know, what kind of a physical interpretation is that? And they say, well, that's philosophy anyways. So, so why did they do that? Why did they talk about physical interpretation if they're going to dismiss it at the end saying, oh, that's philosophy, it's word wizardry, it's ontology or whatever? You know, if, if, there, if, mathema if physics is mathematics, you know, measurement and equations, then they should stick to that and say, look, we're going to talk about equations, we're talking about the measurements we made, then they'd be talking, you know, what they call physics. But that's not what they do. They talk about philosophy. When you question their conclusions, they say, well, you know, that's, uh, that's uh, physical interpretation. Those are, that's philosophy. We don't, we don't do that. Uh, that's not our, in our job description. What we do is equations. And so here you have the definition of a theoretical physicist. Okay? Uh, physics says, employs mathematical models and abstractions of physical objects and systems to rationalize, explain, and predict natural phenomena. Man, they said a mouthful there. That just about every word is questionable there. First of all, uh, physics is not about mathematical models. Mathematical models has nothing to do with, with a physical model. That's the first one, you know. But then they talk about abstractions. Abstraction is the opposite of physical. You know, so if you look them up, they're antonyms. Okay, but then uh, they talk about physical objects. The only thing that mathematical physics doesn't have is objects. They treat concepts, abstractions, such as field, wave, mass. They treat all these at time, you know. They treat all of them as physical objects. They bend time. They move the mass. They transfer energy. They vibrate the field. They treat every one of these abstract mathematical concepts as physical objects. So, uh, a, again, we have a problem because they're talking about abstraction. No, what they're doing is they're, they're using mathematics. They're using equations. They use measurements uh, with their units, corresponding units, you know, like the kilogram or the meter. And, and they're going to use the meter and the kilogram as a physical object. That's what they're doing. That's more than an abstraction. That's irrational. <laughs> You know, if you say um, that you're going to treat a ghost or a spirit and you say, look, there's a spirit and I'm going to draw him. You say, OK, he took this abstraction, turned it into something concrete because you can see it now. But to take an equation or a number like or, or a value less, like five kilograms and turn that into a rock, which is what these people do, turn it into an object, that's irrational. Okay, because now we're talking about more than just, you know, uh, a concept that you can visualize like a ghost or an angel and saying, well, I'm going to turn that into, you know, the spirit. I'm going to turn it into something concrete. Here you're talking about a number being turned into a rock. Okay, so this, this is where the problem starts. Uh, but what does mathematical physics do? Well, they, they have equations. And what do equations do? All equations only describe. Equations have no power to explain. And so equations belong to math and, uh, you know, uh, and uh, explanations belong to physics, to science. Physics tries to explain, not to describe. It's math that describes. Okay, and so we have, you know, these people say that math is, or mathematics is the language of physics. That's nonsense. The language of physics is illustration. You have to illustrate the mechanism. You have to show the cause. That's what physics is about. But to describe and say, look, this, this uh, lion ran so fast or, or whatever, or the ball fell to the floor at such speed, you know, or such acceleration, you know, that's, that's a description. You haven't told us the cause, the mechanism. Okay? And that's the issue. And so math is one thing. Physics is something else. Math, uh, quantitative description, it tells you how something happened, not why it happened the way it did. Okay? So one has to do with description, the other one with explanation again. Experiments cannot reveal, you know, the uh, invisible mediators. So the fact that you have um, taken a measurement and you have an equation, you have not revealed what invisible entity has performed this, uh, this experiment. 
or, or this uh, phenomenon. The, the issue here is, is very simple. If uh, imagine, I'll explain with a uh, little example. Uh, you think there's a rat, and so you see something happening, and you say, well, it's a, it's a rat. The rat was here, the rat was there, the rat was there, and you see the rat at different places. It's an invisible rat, but it has these uh, impacts, and you, you are able to detect the impacts of what it does to visible things, but you can't see the rat. You say, okay, the rat was over here. Now the rat was here, the rat was there. And you do all your equations, your measurements with the rat, with the rat in mind, because that's what you think's out there doing all this stuff. It turns out that if you had the eyes of God, you would see that it's a snake. And each one of those blips was uh, the, the uh, contortion of the snake. You know, uh, so you were confusing uh, uh, many rats with one snake and the undulations of the snake. So the first task of a physicist is to try to figure out what invisible objects are in, out there before you go out there and do a lot of measurements and equations because you don't know what you're measuring. You know, <laughs> you think you're measuring all these mice, these rats, and it turns out it's a snake. Or maybe it's a, you know, fish or a, an eagle. Who knows? First, you got to determine what object is out there. And people say, well, why does there have to be an object out there mediating all these things like entanglement, you know, or gravity? You have to have one because otherwise you're doing your explanation with black magic. You're doing witchcraft. You're saying that this affects that without anything being in between them. And worse, uh, as long as you do it with nothing, we, we, that's, that's quite irrational already. But to say that it's done with mass, it's done with field, it's done with wave, it's done with energy then you're totally irrational because now you're using a concept, a mathematical concept as a physical object. You're putting it in between the two objects and saying, oh, this one transferred energy to that one. No, no, you can't transfer energy any more than you can transfer love. You know what you do, throw hearts at the other one? You know, how do you transfer love? You don't transfer love, you don't transfer energy, you don't transfer concepts. You can't talk like that in physics. In physics, you gotta transfer rocks, that we can do. But of course, if people say, well, that's not what's happening out there, there are no rocks, no discrete rocks, well, then we have a problem, don't we? Then you can't use the rock as a uh, mediator. Okay? But these are the things that we have to resolve. Okay, so yeah, we have energy, mass, field, all this. These are concepts, and uh, what they do is use them as mediators in mathematical physics. Action at a distance, that's a big problem. Okay? Action at a distance, especially for pull. Mathematical physics has never discovered or invented the force of pull, and neither have any of the dissonance out there because they all use particles. Ultimately, they all use particles. They use the wave, which is made of particles. What is a wave? Wave are just vectors or particles that are moving up and down. So it's always particles, discrete particles. And in quantum mechanics, they say, well, they're particles, but particles are not particles. They're not the classical corpuscle. Particles are more numbers, <laughs> values. That's all they're shaking around, numbers. And so, you know, how do you do the physical interpretation of action at a distance with concepts? And you can't. There's only one way of doing it with elongated invisible objects. Okay, that's the only way. If you want to pull on a horse, you know, you got to put a rope around them, pull. We can all understand that. But if you say you're going to pull by, you know, throwing rocks at them or pulling rocks, no, it doesn't work. You can't pull on a horse by having a whole bunch of discrete rocks and you pull on the rocks. Okay, there's no way of doing that. That's an irrational explanation. And so, no, if you want to do action at a distance, whether you do entanglement, uh, gravity, magnetism, you had better have elongated mediators. Okay? Physical interpretations, they dismiss them as philosophy, ontology. And so why do all these folks up there, these great celebrities, why do they do philosophy. I mean, they call themselves physicists. Okay, if you say physics is math, do math. Well, if they did, everybody would switch channels. That's what they would do. So they, they don't do equations. They do philosophy, what they call philosophy, and then they do irrational philosophy. When you question that, they say, well, we don't understand it either, and then it's philosophy anyways. <laughs> so what are these people good for? I mean, what do we need them for? 
to entertain us. You know, I think you know you may, might as well watch, uh, you know, uh, beauty contests or something else, right? Okay, and then they dismiss rational definitions as semantics and word salad. That's another one. You know, they, when you question their definitions, they say, well, now you're doing semantics. You're trying to win this argument on the basis of semantics. We're not trying to win any argument. We're just trying to make sure that we uh, offer a rational interpretation for how this universe works. And these people cannot give you a rational interpretation. They can only give you irrational interpretations. What's irrational? To use a concept as an object. To use mass and say it's a rock. To use energy and say you're going to transfer energy. To say field and that you're going to vibrate the field or shake it or, you know, whatever, energize it. <laughs> and uh, bending of time, you know, what is all that nonsense? So this is the issue. Okay, um, so where do we put this um, dark energy thingy to begin with? Okay, uh, first of all, you know, um, in physics, we do not use adjectives in front of objects okay we cannot say black energy or red energy or you know jumping energy we can't use like that. no no adjectives or adverbs in front of nouns nouns are all like this that rock tree you know uh, a house you point and you name you can't say red house there's no such thing as a red house in physics it's house Okay, red is irrelevant for, for presenting the object. You can't say the white cat or the dead cat or the live cat as in Schrodinger's equ uh, equation and uh, his, his cat uh, analogy there. No, uh, you point and you name. It's got to be, you know, no adjectives or adverbs in front of the noun. Nouns don't need adverbs or adjectives when presented in physics. Okay. And so uh, dark energy, we don't have to look at the word dark. We look at word energy. Is energy a physical object? Is it a thing? Can we talk about energy as a thing and say we're going to transfer energy, for example, right? And here it is under the um, rope model. You know, we have this universal movie. And for those of you who are new here, you will see that uh, you either have static concepts, which are on the top, and they occupy a single frame. All we have in a single frame is objects with locations. That's all we have, known as existence. And at the bottom, we have uh, all these words that require at least two frames, if not more usually, right? Uh, they are dynamic concepts. So the ones on the top are static concepts. The ones on the bottom are dynamic concepts. And where do we find energy? Well, we find it on the bottom. Energy is a dynamic concept. Energy, in fact, is measured in uh, different measurements that they have out there, ergs and so on, uh, kilo, uh, kilo ergs and so on, uh, kilowatts and so on. They, they have all these different uh, measurements, uh, and they treat them as physical objects. Okay, and so here you have uh, energy. Energy is at the bottom. It's a dynamic concept. So uh, we're not going to be talking about a thing. We're going to be talking about an abstraction, a dynamic concept, okay? energy. So whether it's dark or light, you know, bright or whatever, they, they want to put in front of the word energy. It doesn't matter because we're not talking about a thing. That's the, that's the main point. But that's how they define it. Here's the definition of energy. Energy quantitative, this is out of the Wikipedia, by the way, quantitative property that is transferred to a body. So uh, they're transferring properties. I mean, I don't know, uh, are they selling land or what is this property that they're transferring? You know, the, the deed? <laughs> I mean, what sense does this make? Quantitative property that is transferred to a body. What is quantitative? It says a physical quantity. They like to put the word physical. Physical is a synonym of objects. You know, so what do you mean a physical quantity? Just say a quantity, you know, a number. That's it. Or simply quantity. Yeah, quantity. Forget about the word physical. Don't put the word physical there. It's confusing. Is a property of a material or system uh, that can be quantified by measurement. Yeah, it's a quantity. It's a number. That's all it is, an amount with a unit. 
That's all that uh, energy is. Now you see property, it's a synonym of quantitative because you look it up, it says physical property is any property, I like that, property is a property, right? That is measurable whose value describes a state of a physical system. Essentially, quantitative and property are synonyms. So we have a quantitative quantity or a property property. That's what they just said. And that is transferred to a body. What is a body? Well, it says a collection of matter. What is matter? A bunch of bodies. <laughs> So uh, we learn nothing from these definitions, and you can see how little they've uh, put their brains to work to defining these terms. And that's when they accuse you, say, oh, you're doing semantic. You're trying to win an argument by semantic. Now we're showing that these definitions are ridiculous. They, they have no place in science, let alone in physics. That's where the problem starts. They don't have good definitions or definitions at all for any term. All they have, see, when you have that equal sign in, in math, that's not a definition. That says that the guy over here on, on one side is equal to the uh, expression that's on the other side. That's all it is. But they're not telling you what the words mean. Okay, So math does not have definitions through equations. The equal sign in any equation is not a definition. But that's the way they think of it. Okay, When you criticize that, they say, oh, you're doing semantics. Well, word, word salad. Okay, here uh, we have uh, what is dark matter? Well, um, I'm sorry, dark energy. Before we get to that, we need to find out what dark matter is because dark energy is what's going to be on the outside of dark matter, so to speak. Okay, here we have good old Einie. He's going to tell us what it is. Okay, he says dark matter, particles. That's what they are. They, they think of dark matter as particles. And they're ultra heavy. They're dark, but they're not dark. They call them dark, dark matter. Why do they call it dark matter? If they're invisible, translucent, transparent. See, you, you see a galaxy there, and they say dark matter is that halo that you see around the galaxy. And you you know, when, when the astronomers look at these galaxies, they see the stars right through the so-called dark matter, like if it wasn't there. <laughs> So if you can see right through it, we're not talking about dark because then you would not be able to see them. No, we're talking about translucent, invisible, transparent, whatever you want to call it. You can see right through the dark matter as if it weren't there at all. <laughs> okay, so think about that. And so they say to the astronomer, go look for it. Okay, so the guy point out there and they say, you know, astronomers uh, trying to look through them, trying to find them through telescopes. Uh, People at uh, CERN are trying to discover this uh, dark matter by running experiments. Yeah, it's invisible, ultra heavy, but they're going to try to find it, you know, by running experiments. If it's intangible, invisible, translucent, how do they plan to find it with, with an experiment? Experiments is for eyes and touch, you know, eyes and hands. And so <laughs> these people are saying, we're going to find it even though it's invisible, intangible, dark, meaning really translucent, transparent, or one of those, invisible, right? How do they plan to find it uh, through an experiment? And the way they do, you know, they plan to detect it indirectly by the effects it has on something else. That's, that's their logic. Okay, we're going to get that in a minute. Okay, so here we have, um, here's the definition of this dark energy thingy. And this is out of the Wikipedia, it says, dark energy is an unknown form of energy, great, that affects the universe on the largest scales. The first observational evidence for its existence came from measurements of supernovas, which showed that the universe does not expand at a constant rate. Rather, the universe ex expansion is accelerating. Okay, so they say the universe, which is a concept, right, is, is accelerating. It's like saying love is accelerating or expanding, right? What's the problem? Well, the problem is that, you know, concepts don't expand. That's one issue. And the question is whether it's space that's expanding or uh, the um, matter in the universe is uh, exploding, you know, which is a better term than expanding. We're not saying that matter expands. We're saying that the uh, matter in other words, every atom or every uh, star, every galaxy is running away from all others. We're saying matter is simply becoming more separated uh, by distance from all others. Okay, and that's not expansion. 
So the question is, why did they use the word expansion and with the word universe when universe is a concept and we don't know if they're referring to space or to matter? Which one, which one are they talking about? Matter cannot expand. You can say it's uh, it's like a hand grenade. You know, the debris is just flying uh, away from each other. That's not expansion, okay? Uh, but then the question is whether space is a thing and whether space can expand. That's the other issue. And then the third issue would be, you know, what is it expanding against? You know, uh, if, if um, space is a thing and it's expanding, what is on the outside of it? What is it pushing up against? Those are the questions you got to keep in mind. Okay, measurements of the cosmic microwave background radiation, you know, suggest uh, the universe began in a hot big bang from which general relativity explains its evolution and the subsequent large scale motion. Okay, without introducing a new form of energy, there was no way to explain an accelerating expansion of the universe. Okay, so they created this dark energy thingy to explain the expansion of the universe. Okay, so they're saying, they're thinking of a balloon. The balloon is expanding. They say, what's driving that expansion? Well, you know, with a balloon, you just, you put air in there and it gets bigger. Okay, we all understand that. And that's what they're saying, that air that you push in, that's the, that's the dark energy. That's what's blowing the universe outwards. And what is it blowing outwards? Space, because they're treating space as a physical object. Okay, so this is where we're, we're getting to. We need to determine whether space is a physical object. And if so, you know, what's outside of it? Because an object is that which has shape. Hopefully there's something giving contrast to the ball. It's something on the outside, okay? Okay, here we have one uh, fellow, and he's uh, very popular in Quora. His name is Victor Toth. And Toth, by the way, was the god of math of the Egyptians. So we have our own god in our own days. His name is Victor Toth. And what does good old Vic say? Well, he says the following. He says, um, uh, the missing matter is called dark matter. The remaining stuff with negative pressure is called dark energy. Okay. So if dark matter is what surrounds a galaxy, you know, why does it stop? Why does it continue all the way to whatever? Well, because if we had dark matter all throughout the universe, it would be it, it, it would um, be gravitationally uh, pulling, and they need to explain the opposite. They need to explain why the universe is expanding, not why it's contracting. Okay, so dark matter they only sprinkle it around the galaxies for whatever reason. It stops there. What continues is dark energy, and that's what's pushing the galaxies away from each other. That's their notion of this universe that they've created for us. All this is based, uh, all, all of this is backed by pretty solid, rigorous mathematics. Again, uh, to make equations, uh, numbers, uh, mathematics for something that you can't see and that you assume is made out of particles is uh, too quick a step. You can't move to that until you've identified the invisible stuff first. You need to know whether it's a rat or a snake before you put your equations to work. Okay? Because if you start doing equations on rats and it turns out it's a snake, well, maybe you wasted a lot of hundreds of years on nonsense. Okay? And that's, that's where all these people stand. Yet at the same time, we have not the faintest clue as to what these dark thingies really are. Love that. <laughs> so it has no idea what it is, but they're already doing equations on it. Okay. And here he continues. He says, what is dark energy? Dark energy could be just an artifact of the so-called cosmological constant. You know, that was uh, Einstein's biggest blunder, as he called it. Or the potential energy of a so-called scalar field. Or maybe just the energy of the quantum vacuum. I believe that we need to find ways to, uh, to, you know, actually detect these dark thingies before we can say anything definite about their nature. I'd like to, uh, he was right there. Yeah, you first need to identify these thingies before you do a lot of equations and, uh, you know, convince the public that they exist. Perhaps these dark thingies do not even exist. They are mirages of source because we are doing the math using the wrong theory of gravity. Okay, so uh, you can see uh, 
some of these people doubt uh, what has been already proven and served to the public as a done deal. And they say, dark energy, we've proven it. Dark matter, we've proven it. Black holes, we've proven it. We've proven everything. Big Bang, we've proven it. Entanglement, we've proven it. They prove everything. They proved everything. And they say, look, we haven't, we don't know what they look like. We don't understand it either. But Father Universe, you know, he speaks a different language than we do. He doesn't have to think like we do. And that's the kind of answers you get from him. That, you know, we'll never figure it out because we're not intelligent enough. Uh, you know, again, uh, intelligence, right? So we're not intelligent enough to figure it out. And all we can do is search and describe. And that's it. That's all these people have to offer. And then when you get these celebrities, they don't even do that. They don't even do the math or descriptions. What they do is they do explanations, irrational explanations. When you question them about it, they say, well, you know, you're doing semantics and it's philosophy anyways. We don't care about it. So why do they hire physicists to do philosophical work on TV and on uh, interviews and so on? You know, if they're going to talk about equations, talk equations. If you're going to talk philosophy, as they call it, then bring a philosopher in. <laughs> you know, you would think. Okay, uh, here we have, uh, uh, this is the situation. We have uh, dark energy on the outside, which is that black stuff, you could say, right? And dark matter is the stuff that surrounds a galaxy. And again, the problem here is that we can see right through the dark matter, stars which are uh, in that region far away. So it's completely translucent, completely invisible, okay? And uh, so I'm not sure how they're ever going to detect that uh, dark matter or dark energy because it's all, the, or black holes, because they're all invisible. So they're always detecting it indirectly on the assumption that it has to do with mass and gravity, okay? Because if it has nothing to do with mass or gravity, then we have a different universe. Okay, keep that in mind. Okay, so what is it that they propose? It looks something like this. Let me put it in motion here. Okay. And uh, this is their universe. They say uh, we have this expanding balloon. That's our universe. All the galaxies there. And within each one of the galaxies, you know, you find dark matter around, you know, surrounding each uh, galaxy. And then the stuff, the black stuff that pushes everything outwards is the so-called dark energy. That's the anti-gravity. Okay, so, you know, <laughs> this, this, is their, this is the universe that they uh, sell out there to everybody. And a lot of people already know this by heart. And what you see all these celebrities, they talk about this over and over and over and over again. They talk about black holes, what it's like to fall into a black hole. Uh, you get spaghettification and, you know, all this other good stuff. And so the question is, you know, are we going to hear this for the next million years, the same thing over and over and over again, that they found the first black hole, the first rotating black hole, the biggest black hole, the smallest black hole, you know, what is this? What we need to find out is, you know, how this universe works. I need to know why this pencil falls to the floor and not to the ceiling. That's what I need to figure out. And they can't answer that question. They say, we don't know. We're, we're still investigating. We're, we're researching. Okay, how long are you going to take? You know, how, how much money you need for your investigation? Okay, so here we have a good old um, Stephen Hawking. He tells us that, you know, uh, there's nothing outside the universe because if dark energy is pushing outwards, the question is, what is it pushing out against? Fortunately, these people have answers to, to all these questions. Here you have Stephen Hawking. He says, the, newer, the universe is not infinite in space. Okay, I thought it was infinite. Now he's saying that uh, it's not. Okay, but neither does space have any boundary. Sounds like a contradiction. You know, it's, he's, he's telling you in that first sentence there, uh, he says, uh, the universe is infinite and it's also finite. Okay, you know, he covered all the bases there. How did he do that? Well, he says, gravity is so strong that space is bent round onto itself, making it rather like the surface of the earth. So he thinks of space, of the universe, as a ball. Okay? And look what he's going to do. This is going to be his explanation. He says, it is possible for both space and time to be finite without any edges or boundaries. Okay? 
especially the word boundary there, because he's going to talk about no bounds, unbounded, etc. If one keeps traveling in a certain direction on the surface of the earth, one never comes up against an impassable barrier or falls over the edge. Well, good old Stevie here, he's confusing the issues. On the one hand, he, he's trying to talk about structure. And he says, look, the, the universe is like the ball, like the earth. It's a, it's a ball. It's a sphere. Okay? Okay, we all understand that. And says it's finite. Okay, so far so good. We have that black stuff outside the earth. And that's, uh, you know, why the earth is not infinite. Because there's this backdrop we call space that serves as, uh, you know, like a cover. Okay? But then when he talks about bounded, he uses the word, wrong word. He's talking about running incessantly around a ball and saying you encounter no, you know, no, no stop sign. And that's not unbounded. That's called incessant walking. He's talking, he's no longer talking about structure. Now he's confusing. He's mixing, you know, not even apples and oranges. He's talking about uh, apples and running. That's what he's talking about. And he says, look, you know, unbounded means you can run around the earth and never encounter, you know, a, a fence. Yeah, that's called incessant running. It's not unbounded. But when he uses the word unbounded, which is very crucial in this argument, uh, he's, he's suggesting that the uh, universe, right, because he's talking about the universe, is both finite and infinite. The finite part, we all understand, you know, it's a ball. Okay, great. So it's got a surface. But he says it's unbounded because you can run around the surface forever. And so, yeah, again, he's comparing more than apples and oranges. He's comparing apples and running, apples and swimming. You know, he doesn't even know uh, what he's talking about. He's confusing the issues here. Either we talk about structure or what we do. Okay, we talk about. He's comparing nouns and verbs. That's and he calls the verb unbounded. Okay, no, it's incessant because he's talking about walking or running or whatever. Okay, here's another fellow who explains how. The universe can be infinite without um, without any problem, you know, uh, without having something outside of it. Okay, because this is what they're trying to show. They're they're trying to show that the universe is both finite and infinite. And this is how this guy explains it. Okay, and this is uh, Richard Miller, Dickie Miller, and he says the universe doesn't have to be expanding into anything in order to expand. No kidding. Okay, let's see, how does he explain it? I know that sounds ridiculous. Absolutely, Dickie. It's totally ridiculous what you just said. But he has an explanation. He says, suppose you have a long piece of rubber going all the way to infinity. Okay, that piece of rubber represents the universe. Okay, the rubber has marks on it every inch. Now stretch the rubber until the markers are two inches apart. It still goes to infinity, but it has expanded. In other words, uh, he's talking about infinity, which is a word uh, that um, irrational people use in math. Okay, they talk about infinity because they're talking about numbers, and they kind of you know do this sleight of hand where they put the word infinity uh, in physical terms. You know, they they push the word infinity into physics. That's where the problem is. Okay, and uh, that's one other one. The other one is that he says long piece of rubber. What do you mean long piece of rubber? Long piece of rubber is not the same thing as infinite piece of rubber. Okay, if it's a piece, then it's a object and it's got shape, meaning it's uh, surrounded all around by something, for example, or nothing in this case, uh, by space. That we can understand, but he says it's a long piece of rubber, but it's, it's infinite. It goes all the way to infinity. Well, then it's not a piece of rubber because we can't see the shape of the rubber. Okay, so either it has shape all around, you know, or it's infinite. And if it's infinite, it's not an object because we don't know what we're talking about. We don't know what that is. Is it growing? Is that why it goes to infinity? So he's got to resolve that, but he just does a sleight of hand and he doesn't even notice what he's saying. And he says it represents the universe. In other words, they're say he's trying to say that the universe is a physical object and it's finite. But it's also infinite because, you know, uh, we don't know where it stops, okay? And that's not the issue. The issue is you have to visualize it for us and draw it on the board. And for that, you, you have to have a shape. So you can say, look, that ball there, that's the universe. Well, that ball is not infinite. 
And again, we're not talking about running around the ball. We're talking about the object that you're pointing to. Okay, so that, that, those are the things you got to keep in mind. Physicists think of space not as emptiness. Yeah, I know. That's the, not physicists. These are known as mathematicians. But similar to a piece of rubber. But they don't call it rubber. They call it the vacuum. <laughs> Particles in physics are just vibrations of the vacuum. Absolutely love it. And this guy's a teacher, a professor at Berkeley. This is what he teaches, this nonsense. Okay, he says the vacuum is a thing, and uh, when it vibrates, uh, we call those particles. The vacuum can expand. Okay, so we have nothing expanding now. Okay, vacuum is nothing and expand, but he says it's something, right? Just like the piece of rubber. Okay, and he, again, what did he say the rubber was? Infinite, right? So he says the vacuum is infinite, so a physical object that is infinite, right? But because it, it goes all the way to infinity, it doesn't need more space. A clever way to say it is that there's lots of room at infinity. That's clever, but it doesn't really explain anything. <laughs> yeah, all these people, they have no clue whatsoever. They don't even know what they're saying anymore. And where's the problem? The problem is, again, they're trying to give a physical interpretation to their equations. And in their equation, they have all these infinities, zeros, all that stuff that has nothing to do with physics. But they casually transport it or in, uh, you know, extrapolate it into physics, the physical world, the structural world, the world of objects, and they say, oh, infinity, infinity. So uh, the rubber is infinite. The universe is infinite. That's what they're saying. Because they're thinking mathematical terms, and they think they can just... Uh, step over the line from math into physics and, you know, it's, it's okay, no problem. Okay, so uh, I like Feynman's, uh, another Dickie, <laughs> um, who, who essentially, you know, tells us what it's all about, okay? He really puts the icing on the cake. Here's the corollary, okay? Listen to good old Feynman. He was a Nobel Prize, I think, 1965. Okay, here's this is what he has to say. One might still like to ask, how does it work? What is the machinery behind the law? Yeah, that's what we want to know, Dickie. No one has found any machinery behind the law. No one can explain any more than we have just explained. No one will give you any deeper representation of the situation. We have no ideas about a more basic mechanism from which these results can be deduced. Yes, physics has given up. It must be recognized that this is a retrenchment in our earlier ideal of understanding nature. It may be backward, uh, backward step, but no one has seen a way to avoid it. Okay, so at least he said something which is uh, correct, which is a little more truthful, saying they don't know. That's what he's saying. All these Dickies, Dickie Muller, Dickie Feynman, none of them have any clue how this universe works. Why? Because they never figured out that in order to understand how the universe works mechanistically, you know, causes, mechanics, uh, mechanics of how this universe works, how does gravity work, how does magnetism work, entanglement, all this other good stuff. If you want to understand how it works, you need to identify the invisible, intangible objects that Mother Nature uses to do stuff like this. If you say there's nothing there because you can't see it or touch it, first you have the wrong definition of object. It's that which has shape, not that which you can see or touch. And then you are doing not physics, you're doing witchcraft. You're explaining using black magic. If you say there's nothing there with which Mother Nature you know, affects things at a distance. If, if there is no such thing as action at a distance, action at a distance has to have a physical mediator that we can't see or touch. It's got to be an elongated mediator because that's the only way to produce pull, the only force that mathematical physics has never discovered to this day.